My young person is 17, will be 18 next year, so it's an exciting, daunting journey that we're going on at the moment. Um, also, I am the Vice Chair of the Wiltshire Parent Carer Council, um, and our role is to fulfil the parent participation agenda within Wiltshire. A long time ago, my wife and I were told that we would never have children. We went through years of fertility treatment um, and were told there was nothing that could be done for us. Um, that was a transition point for us, a point of grieving, a point of realisation that we would never become parents. And then by some amazing miracle, my wife said to me, I feel different. I just don't feel the same. Well, for years and years and years, we'd flushed money down the toilet buying pregnancy tests after pregnancy tests, and then the despair when the line didn't go blue. But she was adamant that she wanted to buy another one. So we did, and we were just shocked that the line had gone blue. So our dreams had come true, and it was the start of a very exciting journey, and one that I hope so many people have shared in this room today. It didn't go to plan and it wasn't an exciting journey. There was huge trauma at Josh's birth and we found out probably about three days after he was born that he'd suffered a major brain hemorrhage sometime around birth. And it was very difficult at that point to receive the help and support that we needed. We knew, within hours of Josh being born, that there was something wrong. His cry was more like a cat. He held his hands in a really strange way, and he couldn't control his temperature. But we were told, everything's fine. You're new parents, we're the experts, you've nothing to worry about. Over the next three days, things got worse and worse. He hadn't fed. We could barely wake him. We called the registrar and said, we're really worried, something isn't right. The registrar said to us, we're the experts. There is nothing wrong with your child. We've got children in this hospital who are sick. Leave us alone, let us get on with our job. For three days, he'd slipped into virtual coma. We were convinced he was fitting. I actually had to become nearly violent with the midwife for her to listen to us. I was taken to that point of anxiety. And I said, if you don't do something now, something very serious is going to happen. So to placate us, they did take him down to intensive care. I said, we'll monitor him. He'll be back on the ward within an hour. Everything's fine. Everything wasn't fine. They saw him fitting. They started doing tests. They did a lumbar puncture. They found blood in his spinal fluid. They did a brain scan and saw that he had a massive bleed on his brain. He'd been left to suffer in agony for three days. We'd been left to suffer. And it's still really, really painful to talk about today because we as parents, weren't central to that process, and we weren't listened to. Things became very critical for Josh then, and suddenly, from being told we weren't important, he was actually the sickest baby in the hospital at that time. We were told he probably wouldn't live the week. We should have him baptised. Well, he did live the week. And we were told by the same registrar while well, he's lived a week. Don't expect anything. He won't sit up. He'll never talk. He'll never walk. He won't be able to do anything for himself. You will have to declare yourselves bankrupt and become full-time carers. The actual words he used was, he will be a vegetable. That was a terrible thing for a parent to be told. We learned from that moment that actually, as parents, we were experts and we would have a voice and we would battle against the system. 
And I hate having to say that we battle, but we did, because we wanted the best for our child, and we wanted the best life outcomes possible for him. And a lot of the time we did fight against the system to make it work. We were discharged on a Friday afternoon from hospital after Josh had been in intensive care for probably about three months. And we were put in, in a car seat and sent home. In the weekend, there were no support services. He couldn't sit up in his car seat. It was like a rag doll that the stuffing had been taken out of. We said, isn't there someone that can help us give us some advice? Is this the best car seat for him? We don't know. And that was it. And we were left in this wilderness with no support. Well, that was then. And here we are 17 years later. I'm so thrilled to say and to be able to introduce you to my son Josh, who is here, 17 years old. You will be able to see in a moment that he can stand by himself, and he really does have a voice. Hi everybody, my name is Josh. I have four things that I don't really like in life. They are, one, cerebral palsy, two, now this is a really difficult word for me to say, so just bear with me a moment. Hydrocolepsis. That's right. <laughs> See? See, I told you you'd have to bear with me. Epilepsy, that's three. And finally, number four, I am partially sighted. They are the four things that I don't like in life. I go to a great special school in Bath called Three Way School. It's a 10 out of 10. Well, I love collecting clocks and watches. I am also, I am beginning to develop a very busy social life, <laughs> which is very tiring. I go to drum club four months every other, every Saturday, possibly. Rock band club every Monday. Music therapy, which has turned into gold for Friday. I'm learning to play the baritone from nine o'clock to half past, which, which has changed to quarter past. So, and also I have to I have one-to-one -one disabled swimming lessons. I have, and this is really true, so don't make up anything up at all. I have a really special friend who's called Lee. Every time we're away from school, we love to meet up away together to write and perform famous plays. I love acting and and during the past next few years, that means in the future, I'd love to do something to do with performing. Right, my school has been great in helping me think about my next steps in life. Whereas my parents, they found a local radio station who was happy to support me to learn the basic skills to become a famous radio presenter. I know it's impressive, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> I now broadcast live every Wednesday afternoon from three o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. I have been supported to do some work experience in a school office to get a taste of what that is really like. To be honest, it was really, really, really hard work. I couldn't, I couldn't bear to stay for the whole nine hours. <laughs> yeah, I did. So yeah, it was really hard work, but I did enjoy it. So, and I'm really looking forward to doing some more. Here are some of the things that I learned to do. Check the registers.
account money that came into the school office ready to bank. I made labels and also I telephone ordered some stock. Okay, um, our journey was pretty ropey at the beginning, but I hope having heard what Josh has said, um, you get a flavour that things are really picking up and making a big um, positive impact on his life. Um, in Wiltshire, things really are changing for the better, not just for Josh, but for young people in general. Um, what's working for Josh now is he has his own one-page profile. That's really powerful because it gives that, that picture of where he is, his strengths, what people like about him, what he likes to do, and the support he needs to be able to achieve his dreams and aspirations. Other things that really work for Josh and other young people, we now have teams that talk to each other. Wow, <laughs> it's not rocket science, but it didn't used to happen. Working across the boundaries and working beyond their remit. We're moving away from, that's my pocket, that's my corner. We're now working together. We have team around the child meetings. Josh's paediatrician even comes to his annual review meetings, which is so, so powerful. The multi-agency approach really makes a difference. Josh has a personal budget. That's made such a difference to us as a family because we can be so much more flexible and creative in how we use that than we ever could with a direct payment. It's having such a positive impact on us as a family and it prevents us having to use much higher end services. It keeps our stress levels down, but it actually saves money on services as well. And also that, that very precious resource, professionals' time, so that they have more time to work with a greater number of people. In Wiltshire, we have a short break offer, which enables young people to have rewarding social experiences. And the positive knock-on effect is their parents get a bit of respite as well. It's very low cost to do. It makes a huge difference. Transparency, huge, again is key. Taking parents on the journey with you, sharing the information. Parents are very realistic if you share the limitations that are there. There's nothing worse than raising high expectations for parents and then telling them, well, we told you all this, but you can't have it, actually. <coughs> Just be honest and open right from the very beginning. And parents will accept that. Creativity, being able to think outside of the box. Parents want that. They don't want to be told, you can only go to that college. I want to do something with aeroplanes. How can we achieve that? keeping the family at the centre and realising actually the family and the young person are experts. They've walked that walk for however long they've been on that walk. Some professionals might only come in for a couple of months. How can they be an expert in what that young person actually needs and wants? We are scared about the next part of the journey and we're hoping that the changes that are coming are going to make a big difference. We're very scared about post-18. Josh has a lot of professionals who have now walked alongside him and supported him to achieve everything that he is doing now. And we're very scared that at 18, he's going to lose his paediatrician he's had such a close relationship with and really relies on her. And she's there at the end of the phone whenever we need that extra bit of support. And that makes us feel very adrift, knowing that we're going to lose that support. Perhaps losing the social worker that he's got, that could be scary for families moving into adult services. And actually, adult services not talking to the family is very, very scary for families. So I'm just going to end by sharing some top tips. Keep the young person and the family at the centre of everything that you do. Please listen to them. Don't squabble about money in front of the family. We know it goes on behind the scenes. But the family don't need to know where it's coming from. Just make it happen. Align budgets and share responsibility. It's cost effective. It makes things happen. Why do we fund an occupational therapist that works with the child at school and then fund a different occupational therapist to work with the child at home? That's double funding. Why can't we pay for one occupational therapist that works across the system? Be transparent. Right from the beginning. Be open. Realistic. Plan with families in good time. Don't tell them tomorrow that you're going to have to make a decision yesterday. Do it years in advance. 
So families know what's going to happen. Be creative. A simple phone call works wonders. It doesn't take long. But when a social worker phones a family and says, I know you had a meeting yesterday. How did it go? God, the family feels valued. Work holistically. Work together with the family in the centre. Remember that parent carers and young people, they can be experts too. Don't fit square pegs into round holes. Square peg could be the jar with additional needs and the round peg is the service that's out there. Josh really wants to work in broadcasting, performing, presenting, but the only job out there is working in an office. So Josh will have to work in an office. It's not what he wants to do. That's well, fitting a square peg into a round hole. I'm sure we can be more creative well. than that. Trust families to make the right and the best decisions. In Wiltshire, we give families £600, no questions asked, to design and commission their own short break service for their child. There's no lengthy monitoring, there's no huge application. Families haven't gone off to spend it on beer and fags. Those kids really do have good opportunities. So let's be bigger, let's be braver, let's really trust families to make a difference. That was all I was going to say. I think my last slide was just um, my details if anybody does want to contact me.